for coming today. Um, my name is James Schinkel, and I work with. Uh, let me see if I got. I'll give it one minute here. Uh, but I work with Optical Scientific. Um, my background has been selling instruments. I've been doing it for like 20, 30 years, 25 years, um, mostly in uh, environmental. And um, I also have some background in software. So um, I'll get, I'm just going to start this and go right into these precipitation gauges. If you guys have any questions uh, during the presentation, feel free to just have me. Uh, to just stop me. So um, what we're going to talk about is accurate measurement of stormwater precipitation using optical scintillation technology. Um, and what I'll first start with is like early rain gauges. They kind of came out in, in the in 1247, I think, is when they first started looking at rain gauges. 1600 is when they first came around. So this is just kind of a gives you a kind of a history of how long they've been around. Um, OSI has been dedicated to doing uh, optical automated weather stations and optical precipitation gauges for over 30 years. Um, we have a patent on this and we've been doing it, in, but mostly working with like NASA and National Weather Service and, and uh, NOAA and kind of more of the research people. We are a key player in the ASOS system. So if you look at any of the ASOS systems for your weather, we were a key player in the development of that system. So we play a, a, a key role in that. Um, and they've been developed or, you know, kind of put all over the world. So these are kind of the first systems that we did was the Leadway, uh, the weather identifier and visibility sensors, the mini weave is we, these are just a couple of the different types of sensors that we have. Um, we have a lot of different intellectual properties. I'm going to kind of zip through some of that stuff. Um, when you look at like a traditional rain gauge, um, you're looking at a graduated cylinder type, which requires someone to ob observe it. Um, you look at tipping bucket rain gauges, which are suitable for automated weather stations. And then you look at like a weighing rain gauge, which measures liquid and solid precipitation. And they're su suitable for automated weather stations. Um, if you look at like a, a tipping bucket, you know, they're inexpensive. They're easy to interface to data loggers. They got pretty good resolution. Um, it's good enough. Um, but it requires a heater if you've got snow. The disadvantage is it's a mechanical device. It'll miss light rain events and it will uh, the water will evaporate in the bucket sometimes. And if you have heavy precipitation, they really just don't work very well because you have splash and tip time. Um, if you have heaters, you have what we call a chimney effect where it kind of evaporates everything as it's coming through. And then you have um, uh, you can trying to do the heaters, you can't use solar power. So there's just, just a lot of disadvantages to a, a tipping bucket rain gauge. Um, if you look at an example uh, correction factor of a tipping bucket, they pretty much drop off right at about 30 millimeters. They start to drop off really heavily. So if you get a heavy rain, you're just going to miss it. Um, the weighing rain gauge types, are, um, they have good resolution. They can, if you do snow, you're going to need antifreeze, so that's not really environmentally friendly. Uh, they're expensive. They're not really eco-friendly. Um, they're, you know, they require a lot of maintenance. So if you have weighing gauges or tipping buckets, they just require a lot of maintenance, and there's a lot of problems that you can interface, especially if some, you know, bird goes by, drops something in there, you get a little something stuck in the bucket. Um, they're difficult to maintain. Um, another problem that you have with all of those types of sensors is something that we call Bernoulli effect, which basically what happens is you get a high pressure zone above the tipping bucket or before above the device where the, the, the rain will actually blow right over it. So you miss a lot of these events. So if you're at if you're trying to understand how much water is coming to your wastewater treatment plan or understand, you're really going to miss that data by using that type of technology. So when you look at the next generation type precipitation gauges, we've got uh, what we call the APG 815, which is um, it basically all of our uh, systems use scintillation technology, which is a patent that we have. And what we are basically doing is you're shooting a light from this sensor here. And then on the other side, you basically have heated lenses and then an eye red source. So we shoot the light across. And it basically um, 
that is where we're going to be measuring the range. So this kind of goes through and kind of explains how the in technical terms, how there's a modulated circuit and 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 thermistors and stuff like that that kind of explain how that works. So that goes in a little bit more detail. Um, if you look at this drawing, basically what you have is right here you have basically a little slit and over here you have a, 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 a detector. And so as the LED shoots across, it just goes through the slit and then that is heated right over here. So we're just looking at the volume of rain or snow and what the water liquid water equivalent is across that aperture, right? And then that goes in and we have a digital signal processing board, which will give you um, what that rain rate is. So like if you look at a typical afternoon shower on an ORG or APG, we call the original one the ORG, which is optical rain gauge, but we ended up doing snow. So we changed the name to APG for all precipitation. You'll kind of get, you'll see it kind of comes up and you can see it coming down, but you may be able to attribute this to other, if you're looking at other sensors, you could say, hey, this rain event are, correlates to where our, our, our sensor dropped out, right? So this will kind of give you an example of that. Um, some of the advantages is we measure instantaneous rain rates, so there's no lag time. Um, it's as soon as you start to see a mist, we'll pick that up. Um, it can detect rainfall, extremely high rain rates up to a thousand millimeters per hour. And as light as point, it's actually 0 0.001. So I, I got to fix that uh, millimeters per hour and there's no evaporation error. So you're not going to miss any rain events. You're going to read higher than a tipping bucket, but you're not going to miss anything. Um, so if you're basing your, like in Illinois, if it rains a quarter inch, you have to report, you have to go out and take a stormwater sample. And if you're looking at an ASAW system, let's say it's 20 miles away, rain isn't uniform. So it may be raining at that site and not at your site. So, you know, there's an advantage to saying, well, maybe it's raining on my site and not there. But if you have a rain gauge at your site, you're going to know exactly when it's raining. So you can say, hey, I'm taking a proactive report and I know exactly how much rain came down. And then you can back it up because if it's raining at another site, but not at your site, you can say, hey, I have a rain gauge and there was no rain here. So you have something that you can back it up with. Um, there's reduced maintenance. There's no moving parts. It operates 24 seven, seven days a week. It can go under really high conditions. You can have dust or dirt on the lenses and that won't affect the measurement. It's ultra low maintenance. Um, you, you may wipe off the lens, but you can have dirt on the lens and it'll still work. So these things have been deployed in like remote areas. We have them out on data buoys. Um, and they've been running nine months, you know, without anybody out there. So you can have them running in really remote areas without ever having to do any maintenance on them. Um, it's an intelligence center, so it does automatic correction um, and internal monitoring of the sensor. So it'll give you like if you connect it to a, uh, it'll give you internal diagnostics that you can send to like a DCS or a SCADA system. Um, the APG is what we call instantaneous rain and liquid water equivalent for snow. Um, and it gives you the accumulation as well as about 10 precipitation IDs for National Weather Service or uh, weather monitoring codes, WMO codes. Um, but we also have another version that we use for airports. Um, and what's interesting about this one, and it may be more important for like, if you're just wanting to know rain and snow, then the APG I think is really the best one. But if you also want to understand visibility and get more information with the weather, we have this uh, OWI 432, and it's like uh, basically uses the precipitation, but we also use a second. You'll see there's two. Uh, there's basically a forward scatter, and then the 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 scintillation technique. So it can do runway visibility as well as precipitation. And then what you can do is you can distinguish between the visibility and then say, yeah, this visibility is because it's raining or because it's snowing. So if you're using an open path gas sensor and you know it's dropping out or some sensor that's being affected by the weather you can have a sensor that would say yeah the visibility was affected because it was snowing or because it was raining so you can get a little bit it's a little bit more expensive but you can get a little bit more data and when you look at this um So it actually 
actually work together. So one of the procedures to check the present weather would be the detection of the weather. So using both of those, and then also and monitoring ambient light temperature and humidity to determine optical uh, visibility or the specific a better feel for what's going on. So another uh, thing that you can add to both of these sensors is what we call HIP. Um, I don't think that most of the people are going to need this, but if you're doing something for uh, in an area where you get a lot of hail, we have a hail and ice pellet sensor. It's an acoustic sensor that we developed and you can add this and then it, it can add a few extra uh, weather codes where you can start to look at freezing rain or, or drizzle or hail and it'll give you a little bit more detail. So like they were talking about the grid freezing, right? Where we had all the stuff happen down here in Texas. If you had something like this, it would tell you, hey, these conditions are ripe for icing, right? So you would maybe get, I don't know if it would give you enough time, but it may give you enough time to say, hey, these conditions are ripe for this thing to happen. So is there something that you can do to maybe mitigate that? I don't know, but it would tell you those things. I know like for railways, they can use it or, the DOT uses it to understand if there's any icing on the road. Um, let's see here. So it's a proven technology. Um, this is a, uh, we had four of our optical rain gauges. That was our first sensor uh, tested by NASA or NOAA at um, the Wallops Island test site. And I've got some of that data right here. Um, when you look at, uh, they were basically set in the middle of this artificial rain. What they learned is it's really hard to make artificial rain, right? It's impossible to do, but we tried it. So um, we had four of these and then we had some tipping buckets that were in there. And you look at the oh, at the ORGs, all four of them are pretty much straight across the line at Wallops Island. When you look at the tipping bucket rain gauges, what you had was the rain up to like 60 millimeters per hour, the tipping bucket were reasonably that you need for something like that. When you look at this, the tipping bucket really underestimates the rate between 200 and 200 millimeter range. In that range, we stay within that 5% accuracy, but they're looking at plenty of stuff all the way up to this high amount. Where the tipping bucket, once you hit that point, fully makes the drop completely off. And if you have, you know, so if you're worried about or trying to understand the rain, this is going to be a lot more accurate than anything else. If you're trying to just get by, you know, a tipping bucket might work, but you have a lot of maintenance involved with it. And um, uh, USGS is starting to look at these, so they're going to probably start installing these all around and everything will be based on this, I'm assuming, or I'm hoping um, in the future. It's a really simple installation. Um, you just need a pole. Uh, you can do a pole where you mount it in cement, or if you have a pole somewhere inside or a building, you can mount it off, have an arm to allow it, and basically mount it up and you line it, make sure it's level, then you're ready to go. So it takes about maybe 15, 20 minutes for it to get up and running, and it's really simple to install. Um, you can put them on data buoys, like I was saying before. Um, these, uh, the, um, in 1997, it's called the Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission. It's called TRIM. It's a joint US and Japan space project to measure rainfall over the Pacific Ocean and supply the ground truth to calibrate their radar systems. So they actually use our technology out in the ocean where they throw our sensors on data buoys out in the ocean. And then when they're looking at the radar systems, they're actually calibrating the radar with our sensors or helping calibrate the radar systems to our sensors because sometimes radar will look at something and say is that rain or is that a flock of birds right so we can actually help them with that so because it's um the way you can't put a tipping bucket on a on a, on a most of you guys aren't going to do that but it just kind of shows how you can use them um a typical precipitation configuration there's a lot of different ways you can use it. 
Another configuration type that you can do is you can add in other sensors. So if you wanted to do like a weather station, you wanted to add in a, a multi-sensor for what direction, um, we have the ability to take those sensors in and then you don't have to have a data log in there. You can take the sensor into our, uh, these other sensors take and basically send out a string of data. So we can supply you with software that says, hey, here's all this stuff. And most of the people already have a software package, so package it and then send that string of data straight to your uh, SCADA or, or software type of system. And then we can also do custom configurations. So if you want to do like multiple systems or, or look at adding other systems or uh, adding uh, software or something like that, we can do custom configurations for you. We do that a lot for FAA and a lot of the military projects. Um, this is just a, an example of like what I was saying, where you have it off of a bridge. You have a, this is off of a bridge. Maryland, so we're doing this to kind of figure out if I can fix it. We can mount that on there. Um, we have a thing called uh, Maywas, which is basically a custom configuration. It's just a, a automated modular automated uh, weather observation system so we can configure a, a weather system specific to you if you want to look at weather we can do a configuration system like that um, if you want to do like a low power system this is where i was telling you where you have basically your each we have one called the 650 that we developed for the a little bit smaller version like so you can put backpack and then pull out the wherever you want to send it. Um, another system that we have, which you asked about the hazmat, is like this hazmat system. This is just basically what we call a station for atmospheric measurements. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with EPA's Aloha program. It's a free program from EPA that will track uh, if you have a spill or anything like that. It'll give you a plume monitoring system. This is just a SAM that for them that basically you just go out and deploy it and turn it on and it sends a signal back to the Aloha program and then it can help you track a um, if there's a leak or something like that. So uh, that's a free program from EPA and there's some information basically right here where you can have the hazmat, hazmat response or if you have like a then you generate that. That specific hazmat system is specific to EPA's Aloha program and all it does is give you and speed, wind direction, and, and that kind of information. It doesn't give the present weather. But if you wanted to do, if you had your own software program for monitoring, again, we can just create a little, you can put it on like a little speaker, a tripod, uh, definitely configure a system with a, an HP or an ORG um, or a OWI that would then send data out to your system. So it's a, it's a pretty flexible system to do. So that's basically, Kind of what the the APG is um, in the ORG. It's it's a really accurate system. It, it it there's really no maintenance involved in it. You know, I I put one in at a at a wastewater treatment plant. I I went up there and they had about ten guys and I put it on the post and I was like, okay, we're done. <laughs> so it's it's something very simple. So if you want to measure rain and you want to measure rain accurately, then the the uh, the this is a great technology to look at. Does anybody have any questions on it? No. Um, well, if you if you have any questions, you you've got my card. Feel free to let me know, and we would be happy to to work with you. Um, sometimes I do have a demo that I can let out and have you put out there, and you know, for like a month or something, and get some some data. I usually run it just on like a little SD card, so you can pull the data out. But if you want to pull it into your SCADA, you can kind of do that as well. But it's it's 
you know, if you're if you're wanting to measure rain and understand like the storm water and, and back up the data, then I think this is a much better technology than a tipping bucket, because if you try to use a tipping bucket, it's old technology. They break all the time. Plant people don't have time to be screwing around with tipping buckets. You might as well put something in that'll actually work and be zero maintenance and out of your sight, out of mind. And then, you know, you have data. And then if you, you know, again, what can happen is you can have, I know sites that use, you know, uh, they are basing it on the weather station. And if they, if they miss it, they get fined. So it's like, I'd rather have a, a system that's going to actually measure the rain accurately and tell me what it is. And then I can go out and take my sample when I need to take it and then not worry about it. So. What do you guys think? Do you have any questions? No. Is that something do you guys do you guys have to do uh, mo monitor like in I know in Illinois they have to monitor like a quarter inch of rain and then they, they have to go out and take a sample. So if you had something like that, you could definitely tie it in with that where it could send a, you know, an email or something to you to say, hey, you got a quarter inch of rain, you better get out there and take a sample or send a signal to you. So We can, we're on every continent and country in the world, so we can go uh, extremely cold up to really hot. So we're not worried about the heated windows. Like if you, you can have what they call rhyming, where you can get like ice just build up around it, but that typically happens like up on way up on top of a mountaintop. But we do have the, what's nice about it is we have these heated windows and all we need is the heated window. So let me show you this one. You basically have a. So no, that's not maybe the best one. So this one you basically have a, a little thing here. So we used to keep all of this, but now all we do is keep the window. They have this kind of lifted up. So getting the ice warming because that's warm and keeps the tops off. Don't have that problem of uh, of the rhyming. You could have rhyme on all over. Um, as long as we get a small percentage of light across, it's the same thing as our, our optical flow sensors. As long as you have like a tiny bit of light getting across, we'll give you a measurement. You don't need absolute light. You just need a little bit to get across. So you can have dirty windows, you can have spiders, you can, you know, cobwebs and stuff like that on there because we've got 800 million algorithm hours built into the system and it uses artificial intelligence. So as you're as it's sitting in the application, it actually gets smarter. And the other thing that's really interesting about rain is it's not the same in every location. So rain in like Chicago is going to be different than rain in Seattle. Or it's going to be different than rain on top of a mountain compared to something like maybe in the tropics. It'll be like heavier, denser rain or lighter rain. The reason we can measure snow is because snow is a lot lighter and it has lower water equivalent. So it. Um, yeah, we should be fine on, on that kind of stuff. I think where it might be really interesting, at least with the 430, is when you're looking at these open path sensors or different sensors that are out, ambient sensors that are out, is does the rain or the precipitation affect the readings that you have? Like, I know that in California, they want, you know, a certain amount of reliability on those. And if there's an event where, hey, why is, why is this not, why did you not report here? And it's like, well, there was a huge snowstorm and it blocked the light and that's why it wasn't there. So you have this thing that backs up. So again, if you have something on your site that is telling you this is what the present weather is and what the, you know, then you have something you say, this is what was going on and that attribute, you can look at it and it ties and it shows why all of a sudden this dropped off. So could you tie that in, you know, to back up like kind of what you're saying? I think that that could be really interesting. I know like with the military, they use them because of weapons dispersion modeling. We have another sensor that measures like open path wind and crosswinds. So they use that to kind of understand. And when I was talking to a guy in the Navy the other day, he's like, yeah, we really need to understand what the weather is because if it's raining, you know, it's going to affect how that weapon works. So if we can kind of deploy them in a way that we can kind of better understand that, then we can have them be more accurate. So if you're shooting a beam of light across and measuring pollution and then all of a sudden it drops off, the EPA is going to be like, what happened? 
and you can be like, well, there was here's this rain and it attributes to it. So, um, and then again, if you if you're a wastewater treatment plant and you have rain coming and you in you're trying to understand like, hey, I, I have a tipping bucket and I think I'm getting a quarter inch of rain, but in reality, you have two inches of rain. It's going to hit your tr wastewater treatment plant and you're not going to be ready for it. Right. And you can deploy them. And we're, we're looking at developing another one that is going to be a little bit smaller. We call network rain gauge that you could deploy like uh, in China. They're looking at deploying like thousands of them around cities so you could look at because sometimes you look at these storms that come in and it's just like wham it hits a place and then all that rain is going to come somewhere so if it hits your plant you know we can at least measure that all right well if any if no one has any questions i think that's probably all we've got for right now but if you if you want anything i can send you you know just send me an email and i'll shoot you some information they're not that expensive i think that apg is about sixty two hundred dollars but if you buy like quantities, you know, we can discount that. But again, they're not going to be like if you have a tipping bucket, you're going to hire someone to come out and maintain it and, and watch that. Like so cost of ownership becomes a big issue. So if you have something that you can just put out there and then just let it sit out there and not have to worry about it, it kind of gives you that peace of mind. Okay. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> thank you guys. Thanks for coming.